Without any further discussion on my part, let me introduce Maria. Hi, everyone. I am so thrilled to be here. Um, and I'm so happy to see all of you in the audience. And while I will be talking about Sherlock Holmes today, I want to begin with something a little bit different. One thing it doesn't say in my bio is that I'm actually a mind reader. <laughs> I know, I know it's a skill I've been born with and I, I, I don't wanna make too much of it, but I'm about to read your minds. So it's nine in the morning, you guys are probably sleepy, but you're going to have to indulge me a little bit with just a little mental math exercise, okay? So I want everyone to think of a number between one and 10. Does everyone have a number? Okay, now take your number and multiply it by nine. All good? Now, if you now have a two digit number, I want you to add the two digits together. Does everyone have their new number? Can you subtract five from that? Everyone have their new number in their head? Now imagine that your number corresponds to a letter. So for instance, if your number is one, it's A. If your number is two, it's B, and so on. Do you have the letter that your number would be? Think of a country that begins with that letter. Now, take the second letter of that country and think of an animal that begins with that letter. What color is your animal? <laughs> See? I told you, I told you I'm a mind reader, right? So by the end of this talk, you're going to see that what I just did is the exact same thing that Sherlock Holmes does all the time. And it's not actually mind reading. We'll go back to the slide by the end and you should know and you'll be able to figure out exactly how I was able to tell that the vast majority of you, there might have been some outliers, we might have had some eels or emus running out there, um, but that the vast majority of you had gray elephants marching around the small country of Denmark, poor Denmark. So now we're going to see how Sherlock Holmes actually does the exact same thing. So I'm gonna show you a video clip where you will see Sherlock Holmes make even more magical elephants than I just did. And then we're going to go into the science, the neuroscience, the psychology behind this, so that you too will be able to impress your friends with your vast mind reading abilities. Oh. It's a bit different from my day. <laughs> You've no idea. Mike, can I borrow your phone? There's no signal on mine. Well, what's wrong with the landline? I prefer to text. Sorry. It's in my coat. Uh, here. Use mine. Oh. Thank you. It's an old friend of mine, John Watson. Afghanistan or Iraq? Sorry? Which was it, Afghanistan or Iraq? Afghanistan, sorry, how did you... Ah, Molly, coffee, thank you. What happened to the lipstick? It wasn't working for me. Really? I thought it was a big improvement. Math's too small now. Okay. How do you feel about the violin? Sorry, what? I play the violin when I'm thinking. Sometimes I don't talk for days on. And would that bother you? Potential flatmates should know the worst about each other. But you, you told him about me? Not a word. Then who said anything about flatmates? I did. Told Mike this morning that I must be a difficult man to find a flatmate for. Now here he is, just after lunch with an old friend, clearly just home from military service in Afghanistan. 
Wasn't that a difficult leap? How did you know about Afghanistan? A man in a nice little place in central London. Together we ought to be able to afford it. We'll meet there tomorrow evening, seven o'clock. Sorry, got a dash of picking up my riding crop in the mortuary. Is that it? Is that what? We only just met, and we're gonna go look at a flat. Problem? We don't know a thing about each other. I don't know where we're meeting. I don't even know your name. I know you're an army doctor and you've been invalided home from Afghanistan. I know you've got a brother who's worried about you, but you won't go to him for help because you don't approve of him, possibly because he's an alcoholic, more likely because he recently walked out on his wife. And I know that your therapist thinks you're limp psychosomatic quite correctly, I'm afraid. It's enough to be going on with, don't you think? The name's Sherlock Holmes and the address is 221B Baker Street. Afternoon. He's always like that. Ah, Sherlock Holmes and Benedict Cumberbatch. I mean, one of the best Holmeses there is. But he just made my, ele my elephants look, well, elementary. Because he can read people's minds all the time. He can look at you, and right away he can tell everything about you, your history, your family. And I'm not saying that by the end of my talk you'll be able to do that, but you'll be a step closer to understanding exactly how he does it, exactly how he was able to tell that Watson was from Afghanistan, not from anywhere else, and how he was able to deduce everything about his brother, his brother's wife, and all of these intimate personal details that you think are absolutely magical. So today, I'm gonna to talk about a few different things. First, the magic number 17. Second, your mind attic and why you need to clean and stock it regularly. Third, the fact that pipe smoking is actually very good for you. Fourth, that you can't forget the dogs that don't bark. And finally, that overconfidence is going to kill you, but curiosity won't. So we're not actually cats, which is good to know. So first, the magic number 17. My first introduction to Sherlock Holmes came when I was a little girl. And my father would read to us before bed once a week, every Sunday. He'd sit in his armchair. He'd have the fire going. He even smoked a pipe that was called the Sherlock Holmes pipe. Um, really, that was its name. And that's why we got it for him as a present. So it was all very atmospheric as he read to us the Conan Doyle stories. And there was one story in particular, A Scandal in Bohemia, that stuck with me and that I never could get out of my mind. And in this story, there's an exchange between Holmes and Watson, who are now living together at 221B Baker Street. And Holmes asks Watson, hey, Watson, do you know how many steps lead up to our front door? And Watson just draws a blank. He has no idea. And he says, no, I don't, but, but why in the world should I know? And Holmes says, well, there are exactly 17. And Watson says, well, my eyes are just as good as yours. And Holmes says, no, no, it's not the eyes. It's the difference between seeing and observing. You see, but you do not observe. I both see and observe. When I was little, I didn't really understand the deeper significance of this. Instead, I was just dumbfounded because I realized I didn't know how many steps led up anywhere. So the first thing I did, of course, was run from the first floor to the second, count the number of steps, try to memorize it. Then I went outside, ran down the steps, tried to see how many steps there that was. And then I tried to memorize that number two. And then I tried to keep them all in mind. And for a few weeks, I'd count steps everywhere. That's basically what I did with my time. And my memory was really bad for numbers. So it was just, it was one big disappointment after the other. And I thought Holmes would really be ashamed of me. Um, and obviously, I'd missed the bigger point, which was this difference between seeing and observing, or what cognitive psychologists would call the difference between mindlessness and mindfulness, the difference between passive and active attention. So every single day, our default state is pretty passive. We just kind of go through life, we go through the routines, we see what's going on, but we don't really observe. I mean, if I were to ask you, you know, what do you pass every single morning on your drive to work? Can you describe, if you're from out of town, the color of the rooms of your hotel? What, are, what was the wallpaper like? You know, where was the, 
where was the minibar located? You probably, you might know that last answer, but, <laughs> but some of the other details might elude you. Just because you're not, you're not really pat paying attention, you have other things on your mind. That's the trick, you're constantly doing something else. So what Holmes is really telling us is we need to learn to pay attention. So let's look at this gentleman. He's riding his bike and he's also doing something else. What's he doing? He's talking on his phone. So he's actually multitasking. So what that means is he's not really riding his bike or talking on the phone because our minds are incapable of multitasking. It's a big myth. What's actually happening is he's switching his attention incredibly rapidly between the two tasks. So let's play out several scenarios. Scenario number one, the road is clear. Um, there's nothing particularly important going on in the conversation. He's just fine. He hasn't missed anything, um, and he's alive. Scenario number two, there's a car coming, and he's really engrossed in his conversation. That's not very good for the driver of the car or this poor little bicyclist because, unfortunately, he might not even see the car. It's called inattentional blindness or attentional blindness, according to some. That means that if you're focused on one thing, you might not see something else when it's directly in front of you. And so this poor guy can't do both things at once. Or in the better scenario, he'll just completely miss the conversation and he won't be paying attention. Now, if this is a business call, if this is something he actually should be paying attention to, or if it's even his wife, she should be pretty pissed off that he has no idea what, he, what she just said. Because if he's paying attention to the road, he's not paying attention to her. Now, God forbid that the driver of the car is also talking on his phone, which is incredibly common, then we're, we're in for a whole lot of nasty uh, stuff on the road. So let's hope that doesn't happen. But the point is, we do this every single day. We're always doing multiple things at once. And normally the stakes aren't so high as talking on your phone while you're biking and potentially about to be hit by a car without any helmet on. Now, normally the stakes are much lower. You're not going to know how many steps there are somewhere. But for you, the stakes might actually be quite high because while our brains aren't meant to multitask, they are kind of made to wander. So the modern environment makes it incredibly easy for us to not pay attention. We have so many things tugging at us all the time that we're not ever in the present moment, which is what mindfulness is. And we start doing this at an earlier and an earlier age. So when children, who are actually the most mindful people they are, exist, you know, think of the typical child, they want to take in everything, they ask you a million questions, they want to stop everywhere, you know, walking a block with a little kid is like walking two miles by the time you get to where you're going, they've asked a million questions about every single flower, but now we're trying to embrace that multitasking tendency earlier and earlier, and that natural curiosity is going away. And according to um, a researcher at Harvard University, Dan Gilbert, not only is this making us less attentive, it's also making us unhappy. Because when he found that people had mind-wandering tendencies, so for instance, instead of being in the garden, you're in the garden but thinking about dinner. Instead of working on whatever it is you're working on, even if it's a very boring business report, you're thinking about what you had said earlier in the day. Whenever that happens, you're not nearly as happy as when you're just thinking about whatever it is you're doing. And it doesn't matter how boring or how interesting the thing you're involved in is. What matters is, are you present or are you absent from that moment? So I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. OK? Now, Try to empty your mind and just focus on your breath, the ins and out of your breath. So breathe in and breathe out and be aware of those breaths. And if you find your mind wandering, bring it back to the breath. Say, hi mind, I see that you're thinking of something else. Please focus on the breath now, okay?
Okay, you guys can open your eyes now. So that was only 20 seconds. But I'm guessing that it actually felt like much longer because it's not something that we do very often. What you did just now was a small exercise in mindfulness meditation, which is something that scientists have found can really help your brain become more like Sherlock Holmes's. So when we think of that as doing nothing, it actually makes you incredibly more productive. And learning to have downtime like that, learning to take a few minutes out of your day to just clear your mind, focus on your breath, or you can focus on something else. The breath is just one of the easier things to choose. You will become incredibly more productive, more focused, more attentive, less prone to mind wandering, and in generally, happier. So what have scientists found? That exercise, the exact same thing that I've actually just had you do, if you do it for as little as 10 minutes a day, your brains are going to start to change. And they're going to start to change very quickly. So within about two weeks of doing this for 10 minutes a day, your brains are going to start looking like experienced meditators who've done this for their entire lives. And that's going to make a huge difference to you in what you do. So people who practice mindfulness meditation, people who are more attentive, are more creative. So studies have linked that exact exercise that you've done to more creative insights. So you'll be able to solve problems that you couldn't solve before. They've also linked it to happiness. So your brain patterns start looking more like your brain would be in a positive approach-oriented state. So this will actually make you feel happier and be happier throughout the day. It also improves your cognitive abilities. So it's not just creativity, it's overall smartness. You'll be sharper and you'll be able to draw connections that you couldn't otherwise draw. You'll be able to finish tasks quicker. There was a really interesting study of office workers who, given this mindfulness training, became much more productive and could do the things that used to take them several hours in a 40 minute interval, which is pretty incredible because their training was only one week long. And it will literally make you more attentive. And I say literally because studies have shown that when we're in happier states, our eyes actually take in more of the world than they do when we're sad. So our, vis our field of vision increases. So you become more attentive, more aware, more open to the world. And all from 10 minutes a day, it would be the 10 best minutes you've ever spent. I never believed in that, and I never actually did it until I started researching this book. But Holmes has a point. You know, Holmes meditates. Um, he doesn't actually ever call it meditation. But just think about how often, if you read the stories, he will engage in something that seems like nothing. And it's not actually nothing. Moving on to your organized and stocked brain attic. The brain attic is this wonderful metaphor that Sherlock Holmes comes up with for the brain, for the mind, for how we take in information, how we store that information, how we access that information. One of the most famous scenes in all of the Holmes stories is when Holmes admits to us, or admits to Watson, that he doesn't know anything about Copernican theory. He doesn't know if the sun revolves around the earth or the earth revolves around the sun or the two have no connection whatsoever and just happen to be you know, peripherally attached. And he doesn't care. So when Watson is completely shocked and says, but Holmes, it's Copernican theory. You need to know this. Holmes says, I'm going to do my best to forget it right now. Um, th thanks for that, Watson. And I'm going to pretend you just never said, said that. I'm going to clear my mind. And he's exaggerating a little bit for effect. But what he says afterwards really explains his theory. He says, well, you see, your mind is like an attic. So imagine you've just moved into a new house, and your attic is spick and span. It's completely clear. You're like, wow, I've got all this space up here. I'm going to be able to store all my stuff. I'm never going to have to throw anything out. This is wonderful. But pretty soon, you start you know, throwing anything up there. and the attic no longer so big, no longer so spick and span, and you can't really figure out where anything is to begin with. So there are really two types of attics. As Holmes says, there's the fool's attic, where you really throw anything up there, including Copernican theory, if it has nothing to do with you. And there's the smart person's attic, 
the attic where you are mindful about what you're putting in and how you're storing it. So this picture that I've used here is actually not from Sherlock Holmes. I took it from the uh, paper, one of the most famous papers in psychology, the 1956 paper by George Miller, the magical number seven, plus or minus two, where Miller talks about memory and how much we can store in short-term memory. And his conclusion was really seven items, plus or minus two. And that's been, you know, in, in modern psychology, that's been expanded. There is now a concept known as chunking. That's not what we're going to be talking about today. But the point is, Miller thought that to illustrate memory, he was going to use these two attics. So if you look at the attic on your left, that's Holmes' fool's attic. This person, when he's asked to retrieve something from memory, won't be able to find it. He'll have no idea where it is. He's like, oh, I know it's in here somewhere, but he comes up and, oh, it's a little bit smelly and something's falling on him, and he's not even sure that it's really up there. Maybe he just imagined it. But the brain on the right, that's the organized mind attic. So what does that actually mean in terms of your memory? That means that you thought about every single piece of furniture you were going to put in your attic. And not only did you think about whether or not it was going to be put in there, you also thought about, OK, this is important for me to remember. Where exactly am I going to put it? My space is finite, and I want to make sure that I can find it. And so you're going to store it in a place that's tied to your already existing memories. So the more you can connect something new to what you already know, the more likely you are to remember it. You're also going to tie it to your senses, because the more sensory cues you have for it, the more likely you will be to retrieve it. So instead of just remembering, OK, I'm going to try to memorize it, think, OK, what am I wearing? How am I feeling? What am I smelling? You know, really try to incorporate all of your senses. These are all tricks that make sure that your attic has its maximum capacity and that you're able to retrieve it when you can. Because the moment that you have the most control is that moment of encoding. And there's something known as the motivation to remember. So the more motivated you are to remember at the moment you're making the memory, the more likely you are to be able to remember something better. And so that's what we can do. We can be motivated when it's important and demotivated when it's not. So Copernican theory is probably going to sneak into Holmes' attic anyway just because he heard it. But if he wasn't, if he really actively tries to avoid remembering it, it will make room for something else. It will go into his passive memory rather than his active memory. But how we store something really affects how our brain attic works and how the different concepts that we'll be able to recall at any given time. And I can predict from the way that you normally store information how you're likely to decide about different things, even if that's not a rational decision. So we're going to go through a little exercise here. I'm going to give you two scenarios and two options for each scenario. And you'll have to decide which of the options is the more likely. So scenario number one, we meet Bill. Bill is 34. He's intelligent, but he's not really imaginative. He's compulsive and generally lifeless. In school, he was strong in math, but weak in social studies and humanities. So that's Bill. Bill plays jazz for a hobby, option number one. Does it seem likely that Bill's a jazz player based on that description? No, not really. Well, how about Bill's an accountant who also happens to play jazz for a hobby? Okay, I see a little more of a reprover. Now we're going to uh, meet someone else, Linda. Linda is 31. She's single. She's outspoken. She's very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. So what are the options we have for Linda? Linda's a bank teller. Does she seem like a bank teller? No, probably not. Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement. Seems a little bit more likely, right? Well, in both cases, if you answered B, you'd be with the vast majority of people, but you'd also be wrong. 
because this is known as the conjunction fallacy. B can't ever be more likely than A, because B always includes A. And yet, what has your mind addict done? So the moment I give you the description, you start activating stereotypes, you start activating schemas, you start activating your conception of what this type of person is like. And that's built from experience. So it's probably, you know, your, your, your foundation is something that is based in your life. And so then when I ask you, you already have a stereotype. You're not actually looking at the choices in a disengaged fashion the way Sherlock Holmes would. You're already biased from the get-go. And because it's so much more likely from the description that Bill is an accountant than that he plays jazz and that Linda is a feminist than that she's a bank teller, that you, because that includes something that's more likely, you think that Overall, it's more likely. This is taken verbatim for Dan from Daniel Kahneman's work in the 70s with Amos Tversky. And they've discovered that even when given only these two options, the first experiment they did had 10 options, over 75% of people still, even if you explain the logic, said, no, I don't care. B is more likely because it just feels better. It feels, it feels better. They said, I don't, I, I, don't talk to me about conjunction. B is more likely, and you can't talk me out of it. And it's a really, really strong feeling. It's incredibly hard to try to dissuade yourself and to try to say, no, I need to think rationally about this. That's what Holmes is so good at doing. He's very good at just taking the evidence and taking every single person as a person. And yes, he uses base rates. He uses what he knows already. But then he doesn't let that be the end all and be all of his judgment. He's very good at separating the two out. He has more control of his mind addict because he knows how it normally works. He knows, it's not that he wouldn't think B is more likely initially, he would too. But then he'd take a step back and he'd say, but wait, no, that's impossible. And he'd realize that A is more likely. And that's what mindfulness really teaches you to do. It teaches you to take that step back and to realize, okay, it doesn't matter how good B feels relative to A. I really need to be disengaged about this. Now, Holmes lived in a different world from us. He didn't have computers. He didn't have smartphones. He didn't have Google. And this new world is really changing the way that our minds work. So Google actually does affect how we use our brain attic. In one recent study of something known as the Google effect, a group of researchers from Columbia and Harvard decided to see what's happening to our brain attic, what's happening to our memory when we have Google. They found something really interesting. They found that Google doesn't make your memory worse. It makes it different. So what happens? If you give someone information and you tell them that here's the information and then it's going to disappear, or if you give them a piece of information and say, here's a piece of information, it's going to be stored on the computer, you're going to be able to access it later, what does your brain do? It remembers the stuff that it doesn't think it's going to be able to get, and it forgets the stuff that it thinks it will be able to access later. But it doesn't just forget it, it remembers something else about it instead. Your brain remembers exactly where to find it. So instead of remembering the information, it remembers the route to the information. So that doesn't mean your memory gets worse. Your memory gets different. You either remember the information itself, or you remember the way to get that information. And this is what's known as the Google effect. And that can actually be incredibly liberating. I see it as incredibly liberating, because your attic expands. You're able to outsource some of the things that Sherlock Holmes would have had to remember. But on the other hand, there's, there's kind of th this uh, negative aspect to that, because if you're not aware of it, you might not remember some of the things that you wanted to remember, because your brain makes that note, I can find that later. You don't really even realize it. But if you know it, if you're aware of it, and if you say, OK, is this a piece of information I really want to remember, or is it OK for me to Google it? then you can be much more efficient, and your attic suddenly has vast amounts of space. And it's, it's kind of the way that Holmes used his filing cabinet. Holmes didn't actually remember everything about every single crime, 
but he always knew exactly where to find it. So often he says, Watson, pull me the file on some very obscure murder that occurred in Berlin in 1812. And Watson goes and gets the file, and voila, here it is. So Holmes doesn't actually remember all the details, he just knows that they exist. Um, and so I think he would be thrilled with Google as long as he understood that the things that you really want need to be in your brain. Because that gets to the next point, which is smoking your pipe or imagination. So for imagination, you do need a vast base of knowledge in your brain attic. So Holmes is a pipe smoker. And this, uh, this section on imagination takes its cue from something known as the three pipe problem, which comes from the adventures of the redheaded league. So in this story, Holmes and Watson are sitting at 221B Baker Street, and a man with flaming red hair comes in, and he says, oh, you know, excuse me, Mr. Holmes, I want to, I, I think something really strange is going on. I've been given a job just because of the color of my hair. And all they want me to do all day is sit in a room with red hair and basically do nothing, and they pay me. And this just seems a little bit strange to me. And Holmes says, yeah, it really does seem strange. Let's explore this a little further. So the, uh, the red-headed man says, OK, Holmes, let's go. Let's, uh, I'll show you my office. I'll show you the person. Holmes says, no, no, leave. And I'll tell you when I'm ready for you. So he leaves. And Watson says, OK, Holmes, I'm so excited. We have a new case. What are we going to do? You know, He's almost jumping up and down from joy, as Watson always does. And Holmes says, Watson, calm yourself. We're not going to do anything. This is quite the three-pipe problem. So what does he do? He sits in his armchair, and he smokes three pipes. And by the end of that, he's done. He has solved the case without ever leaving the armchair. He's not actually saying that smoking my pipe is going to help me solve this, although tobacco has been linked to creativity. But that's, that's, another, <laughs> that's another talk. Um, what he's saying is, you have to always learn to take a step back. You need to have time for your imagination to work. You can't just dive right in. I'm not going to go straight to the scene of a crime. Let me think about everything. Let my mind play with all of the permutations, all of the pieces. Let's think through all of the possible scenarios. And that is how I'm going to come to the solution. And most of us forget to take that, that space. We want to get going right away. We forget that to be creative and to really be able to see beyond the obvious, we often need to take a step back because what we see the first time might not actually be all there is. There might be much more to the picture. So I'm going to show you how this works on something very basic, visual perception. But your mind works the exact same way on things that are very complex problems. So what do you see here? Do you see? two friends, or do you see death? What about here? Two old people looking at each other, a vase, musicians? Or here? Do you see Don Quixote? Do you see windmills? Do you see multiple Don Quixotes? Do you see Sancho, or is he missing? You can't see everything at once, and you can't see it at the same time. Salvador Dali was especially known for these types of images where multiple things can be, can be present. So here we have a gathering of people and also kind of this ghostly face. He liked ghostly faces, as you see in this landscape, where you either see two people sitting or a face in thin air. And a modern artist took this a step further, and that's Mr. Dali himself. Or a girl having her breakfast. And here, if you look at this man out for a fish, you might also uh, see the profile of one of the psychology greats, Sigmund Freud. Now, some of the most famous images are this of a young woman at the mirror who's also looking into the face of death. 
and this is probably one of the most famous ones of all time, the young woman or the old woman. So how many of you see the young woman first? And how many see the old woman first? Use more hands. And how many can't see one of the two? So which one can't you see? Old woman? So if you can't see the old woman, look at the young woman's neck. That black strand around her neck, that's the old woman's mouth. And the chin goes out under it. And the young woman's chin becomes the old woman's nose. See it now? There's actually, um, there's actually proven individual difference over which, what you will see first. And that changes with age. So it's very interesting how as you get older, you're actually more likely to see the old woman first. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> but the greater point is, I had to tell you to look for both. And if you just quickly looked through this image, you would have seen one or the other and moved on. You wouldn't have even realized what this was, especially if I showed you something like this, which psychologists love. It's called the duck rabbit. You would say, you know, why am I even looking at this? It's not a very good picture. It's not a very good work of art. Yeah, it's a crappy looking rabbit, or it's a not very convincing duck, but it's actually both. So that's the beauty of it, because you can see one or you can see the other, and you can never see both at the same time. And for all of these, your eyes are just incapable of it, and you need to either know, I need to tell you that this is called the duck rabbit, or you need to take the time to step back. You can't just rush right away. If I say, I need you to rescue this animal, are you going to rescue a duck or a rabbit? You need to ask a few more questions. You need to look a little bit more closely. And the reason that I love illustrating this with optical illusions is because it's easy to understand, because our eyes always lie to us. They trick us all the time. And we, we kind of know that, and yet we believe it when our brains do the exact same thing. We say, okay, I want to get going. I've got all the information. Let's go, let's go, let's go. You never, that's never a good idea. It's always good to take that creative step back and to let your imagination look at all of the possibilities. You have to say, is this the full story? Is this really a rabbit? Or might there be more? Might there be something I'm missing? And unless you ask yourself that question, unless you smoke your proverbial three pipes, you're never going to be able to know that you even missed anything. You'll think you're doing just fine. Luckily, we don't actually need to be like Sherlock Holmes. See, look at Holmes. These are three different stories. And he's always, always just doing nothing. As I say, he's one of the most inactive active detectives, I think, that ever exist, because he knows that that's what you need to do. We don't need to smoke a pipe. There are other things that can really help you get that same distance and can really help you get some of that imaginative, um, imaginative thought going. One of these things is nature. So we know that being in nature, so taking a walk, where there's lots of green, lots of blue, really helps. It doesn't help if you're walking along a city block. You really have to be in a natural environment. And people who took walks within natural environments are actually better able to solve problems, incredibly difficult creative problems, than people who don't. And the exact same person, um, there's work that shows that if the exact same person can't solve a problem and then you have him do an exercise like this, he'll be able to solve um, a very similar problem much faster. So it actually changes you in a way that makes you more creative, that somehow makes your mind think better. We have no idea why this happens, by the way. Scientists are looking into it, but there's no really solid theory about why nature and nature only affects you the way it does. There's also good news for people who don't have time to take walks in natural environments or live in the middle of Manhattan, not near Central Park, who say, you know, I just can't do this. I can't afford to take a 20 minute walk during the day. Screensavers have the same effect. <laughs> so there's work that shows that natural screensavers, just looking at scenes of nature, help. It's not quite as big of a boost, but it is a significant boost. So at least you can change your screensaver. 
that's something that all of us can do. Now, if you noticed, I also said taking walks. And walks are something that is actually a very good activity for almost anyone because it requires just enough presence that you don't get hit by a car, but you can also let your mind kind of think about things. Showers work in the exact same way. Sherlock Holmes doesn't only smoke a pipe. He also goes to the opera. He also plays his violin. Anything can work for you as long as it's an activity that you're good enough at that you don't really have to be focused on it too much, but it's something totally unrelated to what you're doing. And then there's this final thing, which is kind of curious. It's the fact that external cues can really affect us. So here you're looking at a pair of doctors, but in a very bizarre little study, well, it wasn't very little, it was pretty big, but in a bizarre study, researchers found that people who put on white coats became better at solving problems. Because somehow, <laughs> simply wearing that white coat activated concepts of doctors, of smart, of people who are good problem solvers in their minds. And lo and behold, they became better themselves. And people have found this with, diff with different things, with um, surrounding yourself by pictures of great thinkers. You know, it's, there is something to kind of being inspired by these subtle cues, but the more subtle the better because here, the white coat, your subconscious is taking that in, not, hey, I'm looking at Beethoven or I'm looking at Einstein. I'm gonna be smart like Einstein. Yes. So, dogs that don't bark. This comes from Silver Blaze where there's a curious incident of a dog in the nighttime and the inspector asks Holmes, well, what's the curious incident? The dog did nothing in the, in the nighttime. And Holmes says, that is a curious incident, the fact that the dog didn't bark, because that meant that the dog knew the person who came in to steal this horse. And normally, we don't even look at that evidence. We only look at the positive space, not the negative space. So this is called omission neglect. We see only what we're given, and we forget to ask the important questions of what's not right in front of us. So I'm going to show you that almost everyone is prone to do this. So here you have phone A and phone, phone B. How many of you want to buy phone A? How many of you want to buy phone B? You've got to raise your hand for one. Phone A? Phone B? Almost everyone's in phone B. Now, the next slide, nothing changes, but I'm going to add one line. How many of you want phone A? How many want phone B still? A few of you? Okay, I'm gonna, nothing changes again, but once again, one more line. <laughs> Marketers love this, omission neglect. We look at what's in front of us, and what Holmes teaches you is to look at the dogs that don't bark. Don't look only at the positive space, think what else can be there. It can really change your mind. And the final thing we need to learn about Holmes is that he never stops learning. Sometimes he's overconfident, sometimes he makes mistakes, but he always admits it. And we never stop learning either. Adults who learn to juggle, their motor cortex does all sorts of great things. Older adults can learn Chinese and have their brains start looking like the brains of bilinguals who've been bilingual their whole life, even if they've never had second language training. So even in something like language, it's never too late to stop learning because our brains never stop learning. They either learn something or they learn nothing. And so your connections either get built up or they dumb down. It's always a process that keeps and keeps going. And Holmes knows this and Holmes keeps it going throughout his life. He's always a child. One of his favorite phrases is the game's afoot. This is fun for him and just like it should be for you. Thinking is fun. Thinking is a game. Thinking is something that we need to be engaged in our whole lives. And we know that this type of capacity never goes away. So let's revisit our elephants before we wrap up. How did I know? First of all, I used a stupid trick, which Holmes uses all the time. I had you multiply by nine. So I know that all numbers that are multiplied by nine, if you add the digits, they add up to nine. So I knew mathematically that everyone was going to end up with four. 
as their number as long as they did the math right. But then I went a step forward. So why four? Why is four important? Because there aren't many countries that start with D. So you're going to go for something called the availability heuristic. You're going to go for the country that's most available, Denmark. Mind data, retrieving the thing that's most available. And elephants, representativeness heuristic. You're going to go for the most representative e, e animal. So that's why some people might have had eels in Djibouti. Well, then you wouldn't have eels. Um, you would have had jaguars. But most people would have elephants in Denmark. And that's exactly the tricks that Sherlock Holmes uses. It's a trick. So now I hope that I've convinced you that if you're looking for the world's greatest psychologist, it's not Sigmund Freud or William James or B.F. Skinner. It's Sherlock Holmes in all of his incarnations. Thank you. I'm sure a lot of you would like to ask questions, so please feel free to make lines over here and we'll get to you in a minute. Um, thank you so much, Maria. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I also wanted to mention uh, Maria's book is available here and she will be signing copies of this uh, directly after the talk, so please pick up a copy. Um, and one last thing, I'd like to thank our sponsor for this session, Louisville Convention and Visitors Bureau. Okay, great. So. Uh, I just wanted to start by asking, um, we're at the beginning of a three-day conference. There are going to be a lot of really interesting speakers, a lot of diverse topics. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any tips for how uh, we can make the most of this um, mm -hmm. using some people are taking notes or yeah. using iPhones, taking pictures? Yeah. Yeah. What are your tips for... Uh, maximizing the experience? Well, um, tip number one, don't multitask. Um, I'm, I'm sure none of you checked your phone or, or went on um, any so sort of social media. None of you were tweeting this while I was talking, right? Everyone's attention was totally focused on me. Um, if it wasn't, obviously, as you now know, you will miss something. And that, I mean, it always happens. I, I'm often guilty of the exact same things I say that people shouldn't be doing, but be actually present. So if you have a smartphone, that's great. I think taking a picture, visual cues, as I said, all of your senses matter. Um, and the way I think that you should also be able to remember the best is by taking notes. Um, and hand notes have been shown to trigger your memory better than typing because you have another sense. You have motor memory to tie to it. So people who take notes, um, but not trying to write down what I'm saying verbatim because then you're also not paying attention. So have a good balance of listening and trying to get the big idea, kind of st stepping back, mm -hmm. but also give yourself triggers, give yourself cues about things you really want to remember. Remember the motivation to remember. Mm -hmm. um, I have another question for mm -hmm. you. Uh, some of the technology we're using now is very new. Mm -hmm. And as time goes on, we learn some of the drawbacks and the, the mental toll that it can mm -hmm. take. Do you think that um, we are still, uh, it's still too early on to decide um, how certain technology can be used efficiently? Um, do you think, for example, there's freedom software mm -hmm. that can, kind of, you know, for people who don't have their own impulses, put the yeah. restraints on them. Do you think that will develop over time? Absolutely. Um, I use freedom, which blocks your internet um, when I write, because otherwise I multitask. Um, and I know that I do. But I think that we're getting a really good understanding of that. I think more and more you see people saying no to technology in certain ways, so you'll have downtime at home. You know, no phones at dinner, no phones after 6 p.m. Right. Um, and I think those are really, so I think that we're already learning how to manage them because I think they're great. Mm -hmm. I think all of these tools of technology are really wonderful and they can really, as I said, expand your mind attic in yeah. unprecedented ways. We just need to know that always doing multiple things slows us down even though we think it might be more efficient. Great. Okay, um, can I take a question from the audience here? 
Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned that you know multitasking isn't ever a good thing to do, but whenever you do multitask, your brain just switches your attention. And I was wondering, is there a quantifiable limit to the amount your brain can alternate? Is there a certain number of actions that your brain can only do? One. <laughs> um, one really well. So when you know something incredibly well, like think about driving a car. When you're first learning to drive, you really have to focus on everything. You know, you need to remember to put the key in. You need to remember to take the car off park. You need to remember all of these different things. Oh, did I turn on my blinker? Did I look left? At some point, that's going to go into your motor memory. You're no longer going to have to remember all of this. It's going to become habit. And so your mind is no longer active on your driving. At that point, you have to make an effort to be as attentive as you were when you were just learning how to drive because you're doing it naturally, and so you might drift off because your brain capacity is now freed up to do something else. But that's the exact type of thing that can lead to an accident. Um, and so basically what I'm saying is you need to make sure that your conscious mind is engaged in whatever you're doing because as soon as you're doing something else, unless it's something that's very rote, like, like walking, um, like driving a car, if you're a million percent sure there's no one else there, which you can never really be, um, as soon as you start doing something else, that takes away your capacity. And unfortunately, there's no finite limit to how many things you think you can do. So think of how many browser windows you have open at any given time, um, 20, 30, 40, and you're going through all of them. Um, and so your brain says, oh, I can do this too, I can do this too, I can listen to music. Yeah, I love listening to music. Oh, what did you say? Um, and so you really start drifting from thing to thing, but really it's one. Okay, let's get this question over here. Um, well, the first question would be, can I ask two questions? Because I um, see there's Let's no go with one first. Okay, now. so then I, I prioritize. <laughs> uh, then I'll, uh, okay, um, the uh, uh, one where you had the, uh, the omission um, with the phones. Um, so uh, disclaimer here, I do have a uh, PhD in electromagnetics. I know exactly what an SAR is and how to compute it. <laughs> and I think what you did there, once you actually put that information there, uh, is you actually played something worse because you were putting out then this scary word, radiation, and without people understanding what that is, you immediately saw and you immediately played to that fear by saying the higher number is the worst one without even knowing why that number exists, what it means, and that both numbers, because there's established science behind that, make the phone perfectly safe. So what do you say to that? <laughs> <laughs> so I could have used that with absolutely anything, and quite honestly, I don't even need the radiation. Um, my point is made just by the weight as well. Most people switch by the time that you have the weight up there. Um, so all, all it really means is ask the questions. And you know, when you see radiation, also ask questions. Ask, okay, is there different types of radiation? You know, I don't, um, that's not my background. But ask someone who has a background, say, is this something I should be worried about? Basically ask questions beyond what you're given. Never take what you're given at face value and say, oh, I guess this car dealer really knows what he's talking about and I should buy the car he's recommending at the price he recommended. Right. Okay, one more very quick question. Um, yes. I was wondering if perhaps during your research for this story and learning about mindfulness in general, if you had any tips, since now that you've told us this talk, we're all aware about mindfulness, but if perhaps you have any personal stories to share about just becoming more mindful, such as the tip you told us about taking a walk or being in mm -hmm. nature, what are things we can do as people who are just now maybe realizing how programmed mm -hmm. we are with our phones or technology, or for instance, having five browser windows up at once. Mm -hmm. How can we take those steps to become a more mindful person mm -hmm. now that we know about it? Well, I think um, the single most important thing is to try to find 10 minutes a day where you can you know, close your eyes and incorporate that type of activity into your routine. It can be anywhere. It can be in an office. You can be sitting. You can be lying down. It doesn't matter. And that really makes you more mindful throughout the day. So that 10 minutes really goes over into almost everything else. And secondly, just being aware is already a step in the right direction. When you catch yourself multitasking, say, OK, what do I really want to finish right now? And prioritize. So instead of doing two things at once, spend 20 minutes on one, 20 minutes on the next. And you'll find yourself being much more productive. 